Today's webinar is on current trends in international estate planning, and we have an esteemed panel of uh, guests with us today. Uh, before we get started, let me get some admin issues out of the way. Uh, this uh, session is being recorded. We will have an audio recording available uh, shortly after uh, this event is done. So that will be released on PaxLinked and distributed uh, in our social media network. Uh, we will also have a full transcript of this event. Again, we will make that available to everyone uh, once it's ready. Generally, it takes us about two or three weeks to get that done. Uh, with that said, let me uh, also actually, before I get going, uh, if you have any questions, those people listening in, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask our panelists, uh, feel free to use the control panel, submit the questions, and I will make sure to send them along to our moderator. Uh, so with that said, let me introduce our moderator, uh, Beth Trachtenberg. Uh, she is a partner at Stepstone & Johnson LLP in New York. Uh, she leads the firm's trusts and estates practice. She concentrates her practice on all aspects of personal representation of high net worth individuals and families, as well as representation of fiduciaries. She has a particular focus on international and domestic estate planning, contested matters, estate administration, and the creation and advising of exempt organizations. She provides comprehensive tax, personal, and business advice to families, working closely with their family offices and other advisors. Uh, Ms. Trachtenberg is recognized as a thought leader on legal development and unique estate planning techniques through her frequent speaking and writing engagements. Her speaking engagements include the American Law Institute, Practicing Law Institute, the Trust and Estates Law Section of the New York State Bar Association, the Philadelphia State Planning Council, National Financial Partners, and the New York Society of Securities Analysts. Uh, with that said, Beth, the floor is yours, and I hope you all have an excellent webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matteo, and I'm very happy to introduce my esteemed colleagues who are going to give us an interesting worldview on international estate planning today. So first, we have Dr. Goran Studen, who has his LLM from Cambridge. He is a partner at JSP Jacob Studen Partners in Zurich. And Dr. Student is the founding partner of the law firm. He is specialized in estate and wealth planning, asset protection, corporate law, and philanthropy. He advises national and international individuals, beneficiaries, trusts, and corporations on all aspects of inheritance, trust, and foundation law, including cross-border issues. Welcome, Gordon. Thank you for being with us. We also have with us um, Gideon Rothschild. Gideon is the chair of Moses and Singer's Trust and Estates and Asset Protection Practices. He focuses on domestic and international estate planning and asset protection. He is a nationally recognized authority on the use of offshore trusts and estate planning strategies for wealth preservation and succession planning. His practice also includes estate administration and the representation of clients clients in taxpayer disputes at the federal, state, and local levels. Gideon is a former chair of the ABA's Real Property Trust and Estate Law Section. He's a fellow of the American College of Trust and Estate Council and academician, uh, I'm messing up that <laughs> word. He's a, an academician of the International Academy of Estate and Trust Lawyers and Vice Chair of the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners, otherwise known as STEP, in the U.S. region. In addition, he's the co-author of BNA Tax Management Portfolio on Asset Protection Planning and is a member of the advisory boards of BNA Tax Management and Trust and Estates Magazine. Thank you for being with us, Gideon. And last, but certainly not least, we have Michael Malloy, who is the founder and chief advisor for Advanced Financial Solutions, Inc., which has offices in the British Virgin Islands, New York, and California. Michael specializes in insurance solutions, in particular private placement life insurance, for both international and domestic U.S. clients. He works closely with tax advisors, such as a attorneys, accountants, and trust officers in designing and implementing sophisticated life insurance strategies to solve a variety of needs. Michael is also the founder and principal of Malloy Insurance Services, which is an insurance agency dedicated to serving the needs of clients worldwide. He is publisher of Life Insurance Law Newsletter and a member of the Tax Planning Opportunities Group. So 
thank you all for being here. The format that we're going to use today is that we have a series of questions that I'm going to address to our panelists and we will have a discussion where people both um, discuss together and also have some time to discuss things separately. So our first question is a general question to set the stage and I'm going to ask Gideon to comment first and then Michael and Gorin um, just to give everyone an idea of where we are with things. We're in an ever-changing world. We have a new administration in the United States. We have elections elsewhere and a lot of changes in tax legislation, potential changes um, throughout the world. And so what are the top five trends that you are seeing in estate planning these days, both domestically and internationally? Gideon, Thank please start us out. Thank you, Beth, and uh, welcome, everyone. Well, I think it's, it's hard to say what our legislation is going to encompass. Uh, I don't expect that we're going to see anything uh, productive from our Congress uh, before the midsummer recess in August, uh, more likely that we'll see something come to fruition in the fall. And we don't know yet what that will look like. Uh, of course, President Trump has indicated in his, uh, uh, in his various uh, speeches and uh, proposals that he would like to eliminate the estate tax. We don't know if that means also eliminating the gift tax. We don't know if we're going to have what uh, the Canadian system uh, has in terms of inheritance tax, which is a deemed realization event on, on death and thereby triggering capital gains tax. Uh, a lot is unknown. But that doesn't mean that clients are uh, not proceeding with doing some planning here in the U.S., uh, particularly U.S. clients uh, who have significant potential appreciation uh, in the future would still be well advised to proceed with planning uh, as long as it is not going to be subject to gift tax because I don't think anyone would want to pay gift tax and then find out that the gift tax has been repealed and they didn't have to pay it. Uh, they might be very upset at their lawyer who suggested mm -hmm. that kind of a strategy. So We don't want uh, that. Zeroed out grats, which is something we've done all along for many years, are still going to be popular. Estate freezes are still going to be popular. What I'm seeing a lot of lately, though, uh, in addition to the inbound planning, which continues, and I think a lot of folks are looking to the U.S. Uh, for a number of reasons, which I think we're going to talk about as, as we proceed uh, in this webinar. Uh, but one of the big reasons that uh, folks are coming into the U.S. is because the U.S. is seen as a, as a safety, uh, uh, a safety country, both economically stable economy, uh, stable for investments, uh, and so people are beginning to look more to the U.S. as, uh, as a flight uh, place, both for them personally as well as their assets. Uh, in addition, I think uh, because of what's going on with CRS, we'll talk about this I'm sure later, yeah. uh, a, lot of, a lot of foreigners are coming into the U.S. wanting to park their funds here now instead of parking them in Switzerland. Um, I'm sure Goran will have something to say about that as well. Uh, and, uh, and the question is, uh, uh, what can we as lawyers do uh, for these folks, but there are also uh, other planning uh, strategies that are available for folks who legitimately are coming into the U.S. Either they want their assets here, they want investments here uh, for legitimate reasons and not for tax tax avoidance purposes. Uh, and and I think I see here uh, a trend among Americans who want to move some assets offshore, in fact. Uh, in the past, they wanted to move assets offshore for asset protection. Today, they see it just the opposite of perhaps some foreigners looking into the U.S. They see the U.S. as being a sign of troubles with President Trump, not knowing what the economy will bring, what no, not knowing what the government, the unpredictability of, of Trump's policies. Uh, and they want uh, to establish uh, a safe haven in other jurisdictions, typically like Switzerland. And, uh, and so they have uh, contacted me uh, since the election. I've, I've been kind of by a number of people who are, are generally concerned about the U.S. Uh, economy, generally concerned about government expropriation exposure. Uh, if, uh, if the uh, foreign exchange controls all of a sudden uh, are, are imposed in the U.S., they want to have an opportunity to flee. They're looking at second citizenships 
to be able to establish themselves in other jurisdictions in case they have to flee the United States. Uh, and so this is an interesting trend that we're, that we're seeing that uh, didn't exist before. That is very interesting, and I've been seeing a lot of the same things. Um, so from the European perspective, Goran, can you tell us what you're seeing as the top five or so trends? Well, thank you, Beth. Um, I must say that uh, many of those topics um, uh, which have been mentioned by uh, Gideon are actually also relevant from a European perspective. I've written just a couple of points down, and, and especially dual citizenship is also something which we come across. And a lot of interest in dual citizenship, especially from Eastern Europe, and that continues. That's a trend where we see many clients asking for uh, possibilities to obtain another citizenship, a second citizenship, um, due to some uh, um, maybe long-term problems they might expect, to put it very mildly, uh, in terms of, of legal um, uh, certainty or uncertainty. Um, another issue is also uh, the offshoring versus onshoring. We're seeing both directions, as also Gideon mentioned. We're seeing people who uh, are getting their offshore assets back onshore into Switzerland, into Germany, um, but also uh, vice versa. There is a lot of uh, um, continued interest, especially from the asset protection perspective. So people who are expecting that they might come across in the future for some litigation as a problem are looking into offshore. Offshore doesn't have, as I have expected a couple of years ago, and you might also remember Panama Papers, it doesn't have that negative um, touch or, or sound uh, for clients as I have expected that. Uh, many clients uh, don't have a, a particular problem if you take the uh, word offshore in your mouth um, in, in Europe. Then in Europe we um, had this tendency of um, estate taxation, yes or no. Um, Austria has abolished estate taxation. Um, in Switzerland we uh, luckily escaped a referendum which actually wanted to introduce a federal um, uh, in inheritance tax, uh, luckily we escaped that. Um, another big impact or um, I would say direction is uh, KYC discretion and compliance. Um, the whole issue of regulation is also very important in the estate planning arena. You cannot actually do anything um, uh, in terms of structuring, in terms of implementing estate planning without coming across um, all the KYC uh, requirements which are changing basically um, as we speak. So you have to really uh, be up to date. And a particular European perspective, Beth, is um, as you might expect, there is a lot of interest in the uh, last month um, from the UK um, in terms of Brexit. I'm not saying people are leaving, um, but I'm saying um, they are looking out what is going to happen after Brexit. So the first clients um, want to be prepared for this situation if um, Brexit happens in and, and not as suitable as possible fashion. So that is definitely also one of the issues. Yes, it's a time of considerable change and potential change. So I think that clients have to be looking both at their home countries and in other countries. And as we see, they are doing that. So Michael, um, what do you see factoring into all of this in terms of people using insurance as a backstop to some of this uncertainty? Well, as, as Goran and Gideon have pointed out, uh, the world is uh, much more international than it was, say, five, ten years ago. So you have people moving uh, onshore, offshore, uh, and at the same time all trying to um, comply with all the tax, we'll call them tax transparency uh, directives. And one in the midst of that, uh, one thing we'll go into more detail later is uh, protecting client privacy. Um, in, in the midst of uh, kind of trying to implement um, CRS, I think as a community we've been a little slow to uh, address this fundamental issue. Uh, and I'll, I can give some specific examples later. Another trend I see is this, uh, just yesterday in the uh, the STEP Digest, it uh, said in, in their third uh, tax amnesty, uh, Argentina collected 116 billion uh, undeclared uh, assets, the 
you know, previously were uh, mostly offshore, and 30% of those were in the U.S. Uh, and uh, it's it, it's interesting to kind of review the different tax amnesty programs for the different countries, and uh, you see that the ones that are successful have a kind of a very good mix of, uh, as it were, the carrot and the stick, and uh, the ones that aren't so successful don't offer clients much incentive to, to, to bring their um, uh, assets back uh, onshore. And then the other main trend I see, is, as Gideon's pointed out, is uh, the assets flowing in different forms into the, uh, into the U.S. So for myself, all those present um, uh, various in, uh, challenges in terms of uh, trying to structure life insurance programs that uh, uh, work for clients. Well, thank you, Michael, and that's the perfect segue to the next question, which I'm going to ask you to start with because it's your particular area of expertise. So that question is, how important is it to add life insurance to a client's planning? And why would you say that it is important? Who on the planning team do you think should initiate the discussion? And can you give us some examples of particularly successful solutions that you've used with clients? Well, the, the traditional uh, reason for adding life insurance is uh, to create liquidity in the estate. So clients will say are heavily invested in real estate or hard assets that uh, there's a compelling need. and. Uh, Clients in low tax or no tax jurisdictions maybe have a less compelling need, uh, but there may be other reasons to add life insurance that provides uh, a, uh, some asset protection. Um, in certain parts of the world, clients want to mitigate forced airship rules, or uh, as uh, Gideon pointed out, uh, with the, the way the tax regime uh, changes back and forth between uh, estate tax, income tax. Uh, there may be other taxes uh, that that increased liquidity uh, can pay uh, besides just the estate tax. Right. In the U.S., we're seeing, I think, an increase in interest in private placement life insurance um, to deal with what, until now, have been higher income tax rates in the last couple of years. Those may be lowered by the Trump administration, but as Gideon pointed out, um, it seems a little unlikely that will be very soon. So are you seeing interest in private placement life insurance on income tax planning issues? Yes, very much so. And it's ironic that that, that was its first kind of a raison d'etre, uh, what was income tax planning, and that's kind of drifted into other uh, other areas. Um, in, in terms of uh, the uh, who, who should raise this issue of life insurance, um, I think anyone who sees the the need and uh, I usually work with a team and uh, ironically you all are my clients. About half the time I don't even meet the end client and because uh, I'm brought in uh, more as a kind of a specialist, kind of midway uh, through the process. Um, so it's uh, uh, the the suggestion of, of the PPLI can can come from any place. Uh, in terms of specifics, uh, for those who have a nexus, uh, clients who have a nexus to the U.S., um, U.S. beneficiaries of um, Foreign Trust, the PPLI works very well in that regard and because, as you all know, the, uh, for the U.S. beneficiaries, the foreign um, trust works very well until the grantor dies, and then the U.S. beneficiaries are subject to uh, draconian taxes that may even uh, eliminate the, the entire trust corpus within a very few years. And it works particularly well when the beneficiaries are both U.S. and non-U.S. 
and the assets are spread out. Because uh, one trend is rather than use the PPLI, uh, practitioners just um, domesticate the trust. They move it to uh, South Dakota or uh, Delaware, Nevada. But uh, if there's uh, other beneficiaries or there's uh, offshore assets, uh, it doesn't work so well. Um, in what terms of other structure, oh, go on oh, there. Sorry, I was just going to add something and get your comments on it and then ask for Gideon's comments, which is that one of the ways in which I see life insurance as being particularly important in planning for cross-border clients is if you have a spouse who is not a U.S. citizen, but there are U.S. CITES assets that need to be protected from estate tax, uh, very restrictive trusts, the qualified domestic trust has to be used, which has some real impediments in that there's immediate U.S. estate tax on a distribution of principles. So with those clients, I find it extremely useful to have life insurance in a life insurance trust. So for the surviving non-citizen spouse, there can be free distributions of principle. So that's something I use a lot with clients, and Gideon, I would imagine you do as well. Absolutely. Yes, uh, and sometimes uh, in those situations, you have multiple policies. Uh, one that addresses the estate tax, uh, with a different design, like a, a frozen, ca frozen cash value, a zero cash value, and another one where the clients have access uh, to the funds uh, inside the policy. One of the other uses, Beth, uh, for insurance here that, that I find uh, is of uh, interest to many clients. As you know, if a client owns real estate in the U.S. in their own name, uh, it will be subject to U.S. estate tax. If if they're even if they're non-resident aliens, mm -hmm. uh, it's a U.S. CITES asset, and a non-resident alien, in particular, only has a sixty thousand dollar exemption from U.S. estate tax. Whereas you and I, uh, any U.S. resident has a almost five and a half million, five million four ninety exemption today. So, uh, it, it someone has a two million or three million dollar condo here in New York, which is not a big condo by any means. Uh, and they die, they could be looking at over a million dollars in estate tax that would be due at their death. So if, let's say, now there are a number of techniques to use to minimize or avoid the estate tax altogether. Uh, if they're smart and they have it structured before they purchase it especially, uh, they might put it into a trust, they might have it owned by a foreign corporation, but it, it, oftentimes uh, they don't get referred to a lawyer uh, who knows anything about this area, they go to a real estate lawyer recommended by a, a real estate broker and uh, and they just buy the condo in their own name and now they have it and uh, and it may take some bit of doing in terms of legal work and legal fees to uh, unwind that structure. There might even be some taxes that have to be paid when they try to restructure the situation uh, but a, a simple way to do it is to purchase insurance. Uh, and if they only expect to own that property for a period of time, maybe they bought it for an investment, the short-term investment, maybe while they're working here, maybe while their children are here in college, uh, then they could just buy term insurance policy relatively cheaply, assuming they're insurable and they're young, uh, or they could buy whole life policy uh, if they expect to hold on to this uh, property for an extended period of time. Uh, and by doing so, they can cover the estate tax exposure, have the liquidity, and and not be faced with a significant depletion of, uh, of assets. Uh, yes, I agree. I think that's the simplest way. It may not be the least expensive way, but the simplest way to deal with U.S. CITES assets. And as you point out, it's so important for clients to get proper legal advice before purchasing those U.S. CITES assets, but sometimes, unfortunately, they don't. So then life insurance is a very good solution. So I, I'd like to move on to the next question so we can get Goran and some input from him. Um, so I'm going to address this to you first, Goran, which is um, how would you rate foundations and privately held investment funds in terms of robustness and popularity for international estate planning? 
Well, Ben, I would first of all like to say that it's uh, from a Swiss or European perspective, not so much an either or, but it can be very much combined. It will obviously depend on the individual wishes of the client, but what we see is that you can, depending on the asset uh, structure, the asset allocation, the involved jurisdictions, um, combine that very well. Um, in terms of robustness, I have a slight, but obviously I'm biased, um, having written my PhD on um, foundations, I have a slight bias towards foundations from a legal certainty point of view. Uh, what we're seeing is internationally foundations gaining momentum. Uh, if we are looking at uh, Jersey, Guernsey, uh, who have implemented, introduced new foundation laws uh, recently. Can I the last couple interrupt of you just for a second, Goran, for our U.S. listeners who may not be so used to um, the term foundations as anything other than charitable, can you just very briefly explain what that means in your context? Yes, uh, glad to do so. Um, in terms of foundations, um, as you uh, rightly put it, in the U.S. context, it is very much, as I understand it, uh, also tax-driven uh, uh, instrument, which uh, uh, is concentrated um, on the charitable impacts and, and yes. charitable work of foundations. So foundation is a term for charitable, uh, charitable organization, basically. Um, now, from a European perspective, an offshore perspective, foundation is um, a legal entity which can be used uh, for many purposes involving private um, estate planning. And um, especially uh, from a European perspective, as, or I should, I should say from a um, civil law perspective, foundations um, are um, something which we as Europeans, um, non-common um, law countries, tend to uh, put more legal certainty onto it. So we have legal personality, the foundation in itself can obtain rights and duties, it can act, it can own assets, which is a major part of the structuring. If I want to bring all assets, I have worldwide um, assets, I can bring it into one foundation. Um, so I'm talking now uh, in terms of estate planning uh, about the non-charitable foundations. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the private purpose foundations. Um, so what we're seeing is actually that the foundation very much is um, located offshore, um, for example, Jersey or uh, Guernsey or Liechtenstein, which is a very interesting, fascinating foundation law um, since 1993. Also, Austria is going to be used for uh, international estate purpose planning, and that sort of um, can be used as an umbrella. And under that umbrella, um, we also like to work with um, if um, the client structure is. Um, implying that with uh, investment funds, with privately held investment funds. So from um, a European perspective, it's not so much an either or, as I said in the beginning, but uh, much more a combination. But obviously, you will have to look at the details of, as I said, the asset allocation and the uh, jurisdictions involved. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, Gideon, do you see the use of the types of European foundations we're discussing and um, the investment funds in the planning that you do with cross-border clients? Generally, we're using trusts, as you know, Beth. Uh, foundations may be useful for Europeans and South Americans, you know, those coming from civil law jurisdictions, because they understand that perhaps better. Uh, they, they like to be able to control it. They can, of course, be directors of the foundations, whereas with trusts, uh, they have to rely on independent trustees. Uh, so it, it, sometimes it's a, it's a difficult uh, transition for them. Uh, but uh, with respect to inbound planning, if we're dealing with, with uh, Europeans coming into the U.S., uh, we don't have foundation law here in the United States, although I think New Hampshire uh, is in the process of enacting the first piece of legislation, uh, foundation legislation in the United States. So who knows, maybe it'll become more popular. There's always been a concern from a U.S. tax perspective as to whether a foundation is taxed as a trust or as a corporation, uh, which leads to some uncertainty there if you have U.S. connections. Uh, but, but generally speaking, for asset protection, for U.S. persons, outbound planning, U.S. persons are more uh, inclined to use trusts. Whereas if I'm engaging in asset protection for uh, someone who lives in a civil law jurisdiction, we might consider a Liechtenstein Foundation, perhaps, uh, which has probably one of the best asset protection features uh, uh, available these days. Thank you. Um, 
Now, getting back to something we started discussing, which is a really important point, particularly with people investing into the U.S., both to uh, try to counteract the CRS requirements and to for those people who still look at the U.S. as a safe haven, um, we get to the question of structuring real estate holdings. So as you started to discuss, Gideon, uh, real estate is often purchased in various different vehicles. And so what, when we have a non-resident alien purchasing real estate in the U.S., we advise them to purchase in a way so that that property is not going to be considered U.S. site as property at the non-resident alien's death. So in other words, the only thing they're considered to be holding for U.S. estate tax purposes is, is some sort of an entity or an interest in an entity that in turn holds the real estate. So let's say a client comes and has a BVI company which owns an apartment in London or owns an apartment in the U.S. Um, or owns both. So when that person dies, if he does not extend his good planning to having a will or other specific estate planning documents, we then are faced with the question of, well, what law is going to govern the disposition of this property? So what kinds of issues do you see in terms of transfer of the asset to the heirs? Well, Goran can probably speak more about the forced airship kind of regimes that apply in the in the European the civil law jurisdictions. But it's interesting you ask this question because I'm faced with a situation right now where uh, a U.S. citizen, but re someone residing in Israel, uh, owned uh, significant uh, U.S. properties in various entities. In this case, they weren't some were corporations, some were LLCs, which are taxes, partnerships, as you know. Uh, but he died in Israel, and he died with an Israeli will. And the will was drafted in such a way that it was very strange. It said, I leave my U.S. assets to the following people, and I leave my Israeli assets to different people. And, and the question then becomes, what are his U.S. assets? If he died a domiciliary of Israel, uh, and the assets are not real estate, tangible property, uh, but rather intangible property, shares of stock in a corporation, even though it be, it's a U.S. corporation, it's likely that under Israeli law, uh, those assets are considered Israeli assets, governed by the estate laws of Israel and how they will uh, proceed. Now, of course, he had a will in this case. It wasn't a, a, uh, an admi a state administration, but uh, it... it there really is uncertainty as to whether or not uh, what he intended were the U.S. assets, meaning the U.S. real estate held by U.S. companies, uh, to go to one set of beneficiaries, or, or whether he really meant every, since he was living in Israel when he signed the will, did he mean that only tangible personal property he owned in the U.S. or real estate that he might have had in his own name uh, would be going to uh, the U.S. sort of U.S. beneficiaries. So uh, it, you have to be very careful in even uh, disposing of assets under a will, of properly describing what those assets are, understanding the difference between what are U.S. assets, what are U.S. status assets for state tax purposes, may be very different than what are U.S. assets for disp disposition purposes uh, as defined under the laws of the local jurisdiction. And it really depends on where you're domiciled to determine where the assets are located and who's got jurisdiction over those assets. Well, and I think that you bring up another really important point, which is my mantra in planning for clients who have assets in different countries and may have questions about domicile, and that is that it is absolutely imperative to have counsel in each of the jurisdictions in question, because the way we look at something in the U.S. may be entirely different from how things are looked at elsewhere, which I think is a perfect segue to you, Goren, to discuss forced airship, which I know you have in Switzerland, that exists in the oh, civil law jurisdictions. Many civil countries, yeah. Um, the forced airship actually in Switzerland, to give you this uh, short update, uh, currently the parliament is discussing whether to reduce it at least. So <laughs> we are not that far um, ahead to, to move it all together, but at least um, th there is some movement coming in because basically what forced airship comes down to is that from a legal perspective, you have a 
share of the estate which is reserved for a certain group of beneficiaries or people, mostly descendants, the spouse, um, further descendants, um, who have a mandatory share of the estate. Now, to give you an example, under the current forced heirship regime in Switzerland, if you have one child and you want to um, draft a will giving everything to charity, for example, under the forced heirship rule, three quarters of your estate are reserved for that child. So you can basically just give one quarter away. And um, the thing is, obviously, uh, through uh, planning, to uh, achieve as much as you can do. One aspect I would like to draw your attention to is um, what we certainly as legal advisors, uh, advisors sometimes tend to forget. Uh, one aspect of planning can also be to um, move in terms of uh, changing domicile. So if I have clients who uh, don't want the forced airship rules, I cannot um, draft them out of the will because Swiss law will apply um, uh, upon demise and we will have that three quarters um, of the forced airship rules. But uh, a simple but very effective tool can actually be in terms of planning to move to a jurisdiction mm -hmm. which does not have forced airship rules, for example, the UK. So um, many clients, um, it, it doesn't make sense for many clients to actually think about maybe uh, if, if forced airship is considered a problem in the estate planning uh, purposes, to move into a jurisdiction without forced airship. Because as I said, a, a big chunk can actually be reserved under mandatory law uh, for, for the um, descendants. But what about having uh, the descendants sign waivers of their forced airship rights if they will agree to do that? <laughs> if, that's if, a big if. if. If they agree to do that, my, my practical experience, Beth, is it will, to put it uh, blatantly, it will cost you a lot um, to get their signature um, up front, knowing that you have a reserved mandatory share, doesn't give you really an incentive to sign a waiver unless the person you're giving your signature to um, is willing to pay up front. So we're talking about substantial sums of money which you have to put on the table. We're talking about liquidity issues, uh, especially if you're having um, assets in terms of company, uh, you, you basically are the owner of uh, shares of company. So maybe you, you would be forced to liquidate um, parts of that shares just to basically um, put the money necessary for the waiver on the table. But yes, of course, um, in an ideal estate planning context, you can have waivers, you can have inheritance contracts under civil law, and most civil law jurisdictions basically sitting down with all the descendants, with all potential heirs, and agreeing upon the um, heirship. Mm -hmm. what, about, some... what about using um, <laughs> life back insurance? On. Oh, good. We, I was worried we lost you, Gideon. Um, <laughs> uh, Michael, do you ever see people use life insurance to um, have assets to satisfy their children so that they are willing to give up on some of the assets they would be entitled to under forced airship? Yes, uh, it has been pointed out to you, you, you have to carefully research the insurance laws in all the uh, all these jurisdictions. Uh, so sometimes, uh, for instance, things will work uh, contractually and uh, in terms of the estate planning, but maybe uh, when the death proceeds uh, come back to the home country, there, there may be uh, uh, taxes. Uh, Argentina is one uh, where the, uh, you can have a, a offshore um, life insurance, and but then when it comes back, it's taxed so heavily, uh, yeah. you might as well not have it. Uh, so it sometimes in, it's, it's fairly uh, specific as to uh, what's going to work and what's not going to work in terms of the jurisdiction involved. But it's something to think about, so thank you, Michael. Yes. Um, since we have, as we've been discussing, having 
tax laws changing rapidly on different schedules in different countries. How can practitioners feel confident that the advice they're giving this year will still be good advice in three years or five years? Um, even if you review your client's positions on a periodic basis, um, what do you see in terms of switching from one sort of planning to another to address changes, uh, particularly on tightened money laundering rules? Um, Goran, can you start with that question? Of course, Beth. Um, first of all, I think it is very important from the outset, from the beginning, to make sure that each and every estate planning is only as good as the current environment we're dealing with. So we all as uh, advisors, not only legal advisors, economic advisors, um, can only um, work on the basis of existing laws and what may be and predictable in terms of if I know that uh, the current legislation is in the process of being enacted. Um, I am not a wizard. I cannot look into a, a magic uh, um, glass um, uh, um, and, and say that over the course of the next five years things are going to change in a certain way. So I like to work on that basis that I tell my clients, listen, this is the solution this moment in 2017 with the currently existing laws in each and every relevant jurisdiction, uh, which works perfectly fine, but as soon as something changes, if you move abroad, if you acquire any further assets located abroad or um, in your current um, domicile, or if you change anything about your current environment, or in addition to that, if anything happens on the side of the legislator, we will have to look at it again and maybe substantially restructure. Talking from experience, if you are open about that from the very beginning, I have not met one client who had categorical um, problems with such an approach. Of course, you have to make it transparent from the very beginning. And do you find, and I'm going to bring Gideon into this on the US side, but First, Goran, do you find that clients understand the need to spend money on complying these, with these rules? Because I have found myself that with our U.S. FATCA requirements, clients are sometimes, let's just say, quite surprised by how complex the analysis needed for proper filing is. And it's really an education process because the client seems to think, well, so you have a couple of forms to fill out. Why is this a big project? Um, but it really is in some cases. So we have, have you had that experience on the European side? And then we'll move to Gideon for the U.S. view. Um, yes, I did, Beth. Again, the question is about being as transparent and honest as possible. Um, mm -hmm. I am not saying that um, every client embraced the need for change with a smile. All I'm saying is if you make it perfectly clear and in an understandable fashion as to why you are looking at the structure you have given or the advice you have given five years ago again, then the client, although he or she in brackets might um, think it is a waste of money, will, that is my experience, you really understand the need to restructure. I, I, I think that, yeah, I think the first thing is the key is to whatever planning is done, it should be done in a flexible manner. Given that we're not we're not planning in a situation that is going to stay static for many years, uh, tax laws change constantly. Uh, estate planning is a process that will last for a person's lifetime, which could be 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. Uh, and the same with income tax planning. And so the, the key, first of all, is, is whatever plan we do, we should do it in a flexible manner so it could be unwound easily without a lot of uh, estate tax or legal complications. Now, I'm reminded uh, recently I was doing some planning for a Mexican family, and we had, uh, they had U.S. assets, and we had a BVI corporation holding those assets. And then Mexico just added the BVI onto their blacklist. And so the family was advised by Mexican counsel. We always work together with local counsel. Uh, the family was advised by Mexican counsel to, uh, in essence, get rid of the BVI company and utilize a Canadian company because Canada is not 
the Canadian partnership would not uh, uh, gain the same kind of uh, uh, negative tax consequences as the BVI would. Uh, and it's, it's not so much a question of uh, concealing the assets uh, as it is simply uh, if, if you can avoid reporting and, and, and paying tax under one uh, regime, then, then clients are likely to uh, prefer that. And, and your job as a professional advisor is to see what you can do within the bounds of the law uh, to minimize their taxes uh, and to minimize many of the South Americans are concerned simply about reporting because of fear of kidnapping. Mm -hmm. uh, becoming hostages, et cetera, sh sharing of that information with uh, with the wrong people. And so so you have to basically build it flexibly. Mm -hmm. And Michael, do you see people using life insurance as a way to avoid some of these reporting requirements? Uh, yes, yes. And uh, again, as has been pointed out, uh, you, you, you have to be very careful and you have to know kind of what the client's aims are. I mean, a client from uh, Venezuela is different than a client uh, from from Mexico uh, in terms of uh, uh, how the, how it's going to work in a structure. But it's uh, it's it's so amazingly unpredictable. Uh, this. I, I just read yesterday that uh, after the the whole world now has uh, really spent uh, millions and millions of dollars to try to comply with FATCA, uh, on uh, April 26, the uh, Congress is having a hearing on the possible repeal of uh, FATCA. So uh, that would be something. After I mean, it is a huge project to comply with FATCA for so many clients. So it's been, uh, you know, in, in one sense for attorneys, it's been a kind of, a, we'll just say, lucrative and somewhat boring work, you know, the, over the last few years to, to try to make them all comply. So then uh, the, you, you have the client into your office and they say, well, they just repealed it, you know. But to, as Gideon pointed out, we don't control this. Uh, we're, we're, we don't have a seat in the Congress. Right. And, and yeah. you know, these, and Goran mentioned uh, the, the work that's required, or I think Beth might have, you know, in terms of helping clients comply with FATCA or comply with CRS. Uh, the, the CRS rules and the FATCA rules are, are not that clear. And so there are many situations where, you know, you need to know, well, how do you determine who a beneficial owner of a trust is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, is, is someone named in the trust who is a protector? Are they supposed to be reported under CRS? Do well, they have control? I mean, there are all, all sorts of issues here that are uncertain, and then the clients don't understand why we have to charge them thousands of dollars yes, to, to help exactly. them come forward. And that is the perfect segue to a question that we're addressing today, which is, and we'll start with you, Gideon, since you brought it up, and then move on to Gore. And what are your thoughts on the position of a protector of a trust being responsible for CRS filings, um, in particular, on the basis that protectors are treated as account holders for CRS purposes? Do you see a move away from the protector concept? Um, or do you feel that where the protector's role is largely limited to appointment and removal of trustees, that that's okay. Just to give a little bit of a background, I think we're seeing more use of protectors in the United States where we initially started out with protectors being more of a European construct, which is someone who literally protects the beneficiaries and is given certain powers over trusts, and it can be as limited as the power to remove and replace trustees, so they're overseeing what the trustees functions are and making sure that they're acting properly, or it can be as broad as the ability to remove and replace beneficiaries and to make decisions on contributions. So, Gideon, what are your thoughts on the use of protectors and how that interacts with the CRS requirements? Well, I, I'm not, I'm far from an expert on CRS. Uh, you know, under FATCA, uh, they haven't addressed uh, protectors really. Uh, under under CRS, however, there are some 
specific guidelines, and it seems a lot depends on whether uh, you're dealing with a financial institution or a non-financial entity, what's referred to as an NFE, or or uh, or a uh, reporting uh, financial institution, which would be a trust, for example, or a or a bank. Uh, it, it there are some guidance notes that Step has issued recently. Uh, that John Riches, uh, who's an active step member uh, in London, has uh, uh, has published uh, or or uh, edited. He's the chair of the Step Public Policy Committee on March 8, 2017, and I believe this is available on the Step website, step.org. Um, and he makes mention of this, and the distinction is really what role does the protector play? If, as you said, Beth, if the protector's sole uh, power is to remove and replace a trustee, that might be very different than many trusts give protectors powers to veto investment decisions and distribution decisions, and they play a much more active and much more fiduciary-like uh, role, and they have fiduciary responsibilities. And it seems that under CRS, if, if they have those kind of responsibilities, uh, they are reportable as a uh, as a beneficial owner, uh, as a control. I shouldn't say as a beneficial owner, but as a controlling person. And under CRS, one has to report all controlling persons. Uh, and so uh, the question is, uh, you know, maybe one must limit their role, or perhaps call them something other than protectors. Protector isn't uh, typically a statutory term. What if we call them advisors? What if we call them uh, nothing? And it just said, you know, uh, Goran Student has the power to to uh, uh, veto a distribution decision. Does that make him a, a control person? My guess is it may very well still require him to be reported as a controlling person. Uh, but I'll defer to Gorin on, on the CRS yes. aspect. Gorin, what are you seeing? Are you still using protectors as much? Or are you trying to limit their powers? Um, actually, the, the, thank you, first of all, Gideon, for <laughs> playing the ball into my field in, in this very complex arena of CRS. But um, I, I can only, I can only uh, uh, um, really agree with everything that you have said. And that um, there has been actually a trend. Um, a couple of years ago, there was the trend in, in um, Switzerland, and if, use, uh, if we are uh, using trust, um, foreign trust, because Switzerland does not have a substantive trust law, but it does recognize foreign trust, um, there's been a trend to, uh, first of all, get rid of the protectorship. Um, but currently, over the last two years, um, one to two years, the trend is going back towards having a protector but limiting his role or as Gideon has pointed out, that's why I had to smile, uh, or calling him um, differently. So uh, we, we, we're now seeing um, trustees with uh, a guardian, and with advisor, a committee is very much, uh, very often used. Um, but I have to give uh, uh, Gideon credit for pointing out, it does not really make a difference from a legal perspective and also from CRS as far as I'm concerned, how you call it. Um, I think if you call it protector and give him too many rights, especially uh, appointment rights, you will have the problems. If you just call it guardian or family friend or whatever committee and give him the exact same amount of powers, I am pretty sure they would still be qualified um, as, as beneficial owner or uh, as, as someone um, who falls under the uh, reporting obligation. So what we're seeing is a trend actually to um, call it by a different name. I don't think that's a very uh, long-lasting uh, strategy. The other trend is to give beneficiaries actually as many powers as they can handle. Now, but this is very difficult and tricky. How many powers can you actually give beneficiaries without triggering not only the CRS uh, uh, requirements and problems, but also by triggering additional tax um, a negative implication. So, um, they're very difficult and delicate task. And then, yeah. and then, you know, in the offshore world, protectors are often companies, other trust companies that provide protective services. And so, if so, if uh, the protector is simply a an entity, uh, then the question is, well, who are the beneficial owners of that entity? Uh, and you start getting into all sorts of other complications as to whether uh, those people who are unrelated to uh, uh, any uh, an, any potential real beneficiaries in the trust uh, would they have to be reported under under CRS regimes? Well, so a, a, an idea that's closely related to this is that 
one of the things I think many of us U.S. advisors are seeing when we have a practice that encompasses cross-border planning is that many clients residing in countries that are now going to be subject to CRS are thinking about moving their assets to the U.S., which I find to be quite ironic since the U.S. started this whole thing with FATCA. So um, what are the obstacles and traps that exist for non-U.S. people wanting to move assets to the U.S. in order to avoid CRS? Obviously, we have to worry about tax issues, uh, number one, but also transferring those assets properly. Um, Michael, what are your thoughts on this, and how do you deal with these issues? Are you seeing this? Well, the, um, it's interesting. Uh, FATCA, in a certain sense, is mostly a one-way street with information flowing back to the IRS. But at the same time in FATCA, there are these uh, IGAs, intergovernmental agreements. So, uh, and they can be turned on at will, like a few months ago, the um, U.S. reported to the uh, Israeli government the existence of undisclosed bank accounts. So, uh, I think some clients are, uh, they, uh, or they, they, they move uh, some assets, say, to Nevada or South Dakota, and uh, form an LLC, but then they have other assets offshore, and they think, you know, this, the, the LLC is going to block everything. You know, they, um, it's kind of a, for clients without a sophisticated advisor, there, there are a lot of traps, and just the, say, moving, uh, moving things to the U.S. Well, Gideon, what kind of advice are you giving clients as a sophisticated advisor on how to move assets here and avoid some pitfalls or tax traps? Well, I, I think, first of all, um, I believe that a lawyer has some obligation, ethical obligation, to ensure that uh, the client is uh, is not engaged in money laundering or terrorist financing. Which is uh, and and, so and I what think do you do that, to, and I think if, if I create a trust for someone to receive assets here um, and and uh, and don't inquire as to the source of funds, uh, at the end of the day, the bank is going to inquire. So if I create a trust structure and then they can't fund it here in the U.S. because the bank doesn't, they don't pass the bank's KYC due diligence requirements, then then the, They've spent a lot of money for no reason at all. Uh, so the first thing I tell clients is, why don't you go to a bank, give them all that K the KYC information that they would need to open up an account with uh, that would benefit any of the beneficial owners. So that means provide the bank with passports and, and residence proof and provide them with source of funds proof and professional references, bank references, et cetera. And, and having spoken recently to some banks uh, to find out what their own KYC process is like because banks, of course, in the U.S. have to file suspicious transaction reports. So how do they determine whether money being wired in here uh, constitutes uh, potentially a money laundering offense uh, or, or, uh, or terrorist financing? And, and the interesting part of that equation is that what do you define as money laundering offense? And under U.S. laws, uh, tax evasion you may be surprised, it's not a money laundering offense. Uh, yet under foreign countries' laws, uh, tax evasion on, on most of the developed countries, uh, tax evasion is a, a, an enumerated money laundering offense. So if, for example, a, uh, a Colombian uh, has not been reporting his assets and income that he has in a Swiss account, uh, and now be given CRS, uh, is concerned and is going to wants to move his Swiss account into the U.S. to Delaware to be held by an LLC or a trust, um, and uh, and he uh, has to explain to the bank here uh, about the Swiss account and whether uh, he has been 
in reporting it to his uh, home authorities. And I think the banks are beginning to ask those questions because even though uh, under U.S. law tax evasion isn't, uh, isn't a predicate offense, we have a Supreme Court case, as you know, about Pasquantino, uh, rule decided a number of years ago, uh, that that it is possible that the U.S. can prosecute someone for uh, uh, for violating even foreign countries' tax laws, uh, which is what Pat Squintino basically held. Now, uh, I, for one, am concerned about that. I would not want, uh, and I've turned away a lot of clients because of that. Uh, I don't want to be uh, a target of a U.S. prosecutor uh, or, or a target of, of an ethical violation uh, in assisting someone with uh, what is knowingly uh, a money laundering offense in their home country, and, and so uh, if if they have uh, if they've provided me with proper assurance that they've reported their income and assets to their home country, now maybe it's not reportable. Maybe their home country has has a policy, territorial policy. If it, my money is in Switzerland, I don't have to report that income. Then fine, as long as I get some local council representation of that. Uh, then, then I'm fine with uh, being engaged uh, to establish a structure here for them to invest through. I think that's a really important point because while it's our responsibility to zealously represent our clients, I think it's very easy to cross over a line with all good intents to represent the client well and give them a great result where then we're opening ourselves up to what could possibly be very severe consequences. And I know that I get a lot of inquiries and I, especially when I get that uneasy feeling about what is this about? I ask a lot of questions about what is the source of the money? Why is it the family's desire to bring it into the United States? Please give me specifics on what these businesses are overseas and where this money is coming from. And I find that sometimes when I drill down and ask these questions, the client disappears and I don't hear from them again, which I actually consider to be a good result. But closely related to our concern is the concern that you have now, Gorin, in the EU where first the United Kingdom introduced its law to have a public registry of beneficial owners for companies registered. Um, and that is more widespread in terms of the EU where they have more reporting requirements than we do and it's something we've looked at here over the years and have tried to avoid because it really conflicts with our attorney-client roles of privilege because we can't go and report all of the details of a trust that we create in terms of who is the grantor, who are the beneficiaries. How are you handling that, Goran? on your end? Well, um, to uh, start off this particular point is I have just recently written an article um, which will be published in August uh, on the transparency registry which Germany is now um, um, introducing on the basis of this EU, uh, EU legislation. So uh, the UK was the first mover, now we're seeing this as dominoes basically across the whole of Europe. Um, talking about now specifically, this is a non-Swiss issue. Switzerland is also trying to implement certain uh, transparency registry requirements, but, but on a very reasonable, I would say, Swiss um, way. Talking about now Germany is, um, if you want to see far-reaching um, legislation, please feel free to look at the German uh, uh, Legislative Act in terms of introducing this transparency register. It is complicated. It is even for legal experts almost impossible to understand what reporting obligations exist. As you pointed out, client attorney privilege is something we as attorneys had to bring up um, in Parliament in Germany to say there is actually a red line you should not cross in terms of client attorney privilege. Whether the uh, uh, legislator will actually take this into account, I cannot tell you at this point. It is preposterous what is expected down the line. I can only say if this legislation passes in Germany and if it becomes um, a, mold, uh, a role model for other EU jurisdictions, this would certainly be of a, a big disadvantage uh, for setting up any company, I, I must say it in Germany, 
those reporting obligations are very far reaching. We're not talking about if you're owning 25% or more shares in a company, um, you have to give that information, uh, not only to the bank, obviously, but report it um, to the state. What is that being done with that information? No one currently knows who is going to have access to that um, registry. Currently, no one knows, as the legislator uh, has only pointed out, every person with an interest might have a look into that. Now, you can imagine if, uh, if I'm going to uh, have legislation and I'm interested in finding out about your assets, I might be actually considered someone um, as a plaintiff who has an uh, interest in um, looking into that. If you have clients from South America where you have um, deeply rooted angst and, and feelings um, about being kidnapped and protecting um, your, your children, your, your family, um, and you have um, knowingly now a transparency register, which basically um, gives away every piece of information about your assets, it's going to be a huge blow, I think, um, from, from an estate planning purpose um, for, for the entire EU. Yeah, I, that's a big issue that we're going to have to keep watching because it has a real ripple effect everywhere. Um, I think it would be nice as we're heading to the end of our session to talk about some basics that will be useful to our listeners, which is what strategies are you seeing most frequently used to protect the ownership of U.S. assets by non-U.S. people who want to own assets in the U.S. but without being subject to U.S. estate or gift tax. So I'll start with you, Gideon, on this. And then, Michael, I will ask you to help us in terms of what you see, particularly with insurance. We've discussed this a bit, but I'd like to just give an overall framework for our listeners. Well, as we mentioned earlier, having U.S. assets, uh, and we have to define what a U.S. asset is in a moment, uh, owned by a non-resident alien will subject them to U.S. estate tax upon their death. I have one situation now where uh, an individual had a uh, million dollar securities portfolio with UBS uh, and died, and now uh, her spouse, uh, also non-U.S. resident, non-U.S. domiciliary, uh, was trying to get the money out of that UBS account. UBS froze it and they won't release it until they receive a transfer certificate from the IRS, which could take six to nine months. Uh, and uh, that's very unfortunate because had they had proper advice, uh, they could have avoided this altogether. And the one thing that's interesting, although U.S. persons can't easily avoid the state tax, assuming they have more than $5 million, more than the exempt amount, uh, giving it away is subject to gift tax potentially. Non-U.S. persons can easily avoid U.S. estate tax if they simply uh, avail themselves of the proper strategy. So, for example, uh, the easiest uh, is, is to form a foreign corporation that will hold these U.S. assets. So if this individual had had, a, let's say, a BVI corporation uh, owning the uh, U.S. securities account, there would be no estate tax. Uh, there would be no gift tax consequence. There would be no estate tax consequence. They could fund that BVI corporation with cash, open up a UBS account, and then fund it with securities, invest in securities, and, and when they die, there is absolutely no tax consequence whatsoever. And that well, account will have the same benefit uh, from an income tax standpoint, since it's a not treated as a non-resident alien, not subject to capital gains tax, not subject to any portfolio interest tax on portfolio debt, meaning bonds, and only subject to some dividend withholding on any stocks that pay dividends. I just want to uh, which is, one yeah. thing here, Gideon, which is that I always find it interesting that there's a disconnect between our gift tax, gift tax. and our estate tax system in terms of securities, because from an estate tax perspective, a non-resident alien is subject to estate tax on U.S securities because those are considered U.S. citus assets for estate tax purposes, but I don't know what the legislative intent behind this is, but they are not considered U.S. citus assets Correct. for gift tax purposes. So the easiest thing in a situation like that is for someone to just give away those assets before they die because then there's no gift right. tax, but of course they of may course, Of course you need to know when you're going to die. 
Well, yeah, you yeah, need to know there's what that too. You need to have that crystal that. ball. Yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a true point, Gideon. But go right. on. Right. But but you know, for those that don't know when they're going to die, and and therefore won't know to give away those securities beforehand, uh, forming that corporate foreign corporation is is the quickest and easiest answer. Uh, now now a, another way of doing it so that you don't have to deal with the issue that we touched on earlier, and that is. Uh, who do those assets then belong to when you die? Uh, who does the corporate stock, under what laws does that corporate stock pass to the next, uh, the heirs at law? Uh, if you have a will or you don't have a will, uh, but you can take that uh, foreign corporation and put it into a trust structure. Uh, or you could have it avoid the foreign corporation altogether and create a trust that would be considered a, a foreign trust. And as long as the grantor, the person creating that trust, doesn't retain certain strings, which doesn't retain the power to revoke, doesn't retain the right to income, uh, because those would all cause a state tax inclusion. Uh, as long as it's structured properly, they could have a trust that could own those securities. And the same thing goes with real estate. Now, real estate is a little bit more complicated in terms of structuring, particularly if it's investment property and you're going to get rental income, because there are all sorts of income tax consequences if the real estate is owned, for example, by a foreign corporation. Uh, many stra uh, planners would recommend that the real estate be owned by a U.S. corporation, which in turn is owned by a foreign corporation. Uh, you then have double taxation with respect to corporate tax, and it might be more tax efficient to have the real estate owned by a trust. A trust is a little bit more complicated. A trust requires trustees to be paid each year. Uh, U.S. trustees, perhaps, maybe foreign trustees, depending on what you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, there are a lot of different ways of, of forming that trust. Uh, and the legal fees are higher than simply forming a, a couple of corporate entities. Uh, but a trust may be the best approach because from an income tax standpoint, you don't have double taxation. So uh, those are the primary ways that, that U.S. assets should be held if you want to avoid U.S. estate tax. And there's a, 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 uh, an outline that I've prepared, uh, a PowerPoint presentation that I believe is included uh, with, with this uh, downloadable uh, video or audio, whatever it's going to be, uh, which you might uh, want to avail yourself of. Okay, thanks, Gideon. Michael, um, do you have anything you want to add to that? And then in our remaining time, which is short, um, there's a question from a listener for Gorin, which I hope we can get to. Uh, yes, I'll, uh, I'll be brief. I, I'll just use an example. As I said before, the whether insurance works, uh, that depends on the client's home country if for non-U.S. persons. And there was a, um, a question came in uh, that, that was uh, part of the beginning questions uh, for our panel here about from a South African. So say for South African, uh, they, the, their laws allow them to have offshore insurance, but the, the transaction has to take place outside of South Africa and the assets that are going to go into the policy already have to be offshore. And then you have an effective um, uh, estate tax blocker. So uh, like uh, Gideon said, uh, we always use uh, home country council because we want an opinion on uh, from the home country whether what, what the insurance laws there are uh, for, uh, for their country, even though these are U.S. CITES assets, they're going inside a, a, a policy, but ultimately, if the money is going back to their home country, you want it to come back uh, free and clear of tax. Yes. I, I want to stress again how important it is to use a home country lawyer because you may think that the rules must be similar, but um, invariably they are not, and that could lead to some very unpleasant surprises. So in our remaining couple of minutes, Goran, we have a question which is that if a country criminalized tax evasion such as Switzerland is the financial institution going to report under CRS the beneficial owner under AML or under the CRS rules? For example, beneficial owner of assets is a life insurance company, but for AML, KYC, 
the beneficial owner is the life insurance policy owner. If you can parse through that um, and give us an answer, that would be great. Yes, thank you, Beth. Uh, well, to, to make a very complicated, um, or to give a very short answer to a very complicated question, it will usually be under the AML uh, regulation, but I would not rule out that the bank in question, the financial institution, will also trigger internally and, and um, uh, the terms of reporting the CRS as well. So uh, most probably, um, from a Swiss perspective, both would be reported. But the AML would definitely be reported in terms of um, the um, LY and life insurance policy. Okay, thank you, Goran. So I want to thank each of our panelists. It was a really interesting panel discussion, and I think we got a lot of very useful and interesting perspectives from each of you in your particular areas of expertise. So 